that. Again, we want to thank the United States Army Corps of Engineers and, uh, and your continued partnership with us. I talked to Colonel Sattinger yesterday, and uh, you're helpful not only with, obviously, with this, but also the Flood Task Force and a variety of other things that, that's happening. So with that, we want to turn it over to you and uh, hear your presentation, and then a little bit of follow-up by Nicole. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon. Thanks, Mayor and Council. Uh, we're glad to be here. Uh, my name is Roger Burke. I am the Chief of Engineering and Construction here in Rock Island. Uh, this is Matt Stewart. He is our Chief of Geotechnical Engineering. Uh, after the, the flood barrier, after there was the failure, there was a request from the city that the Corps participate in uh, having a, putting a report together and he was coming over and doing an assessment. Uh, so, and putting a small, putting that report together as well as meeting with some of the participants. That happened on the 13th of May. We got together after the failure had happened on the 30th of April. The team consisted of Army Corps of Engineer personnel from Engineering and Emergency Management, uh, as well as city officials and some of the city personnel who were in charge of putting up the HESCO barrier, and as well as a representative from HESCO themselves. Uh, on our May 13th meeting, uh, we had a discussion of the events that led up to and during the HESCO failure. We reviewed the surveillance video that came from the Rome cameras, uh, site visit to the location of the barrier failure, and then had a discussion with uh, some of the witnesses of the event. Since then, uh, we have done some evaluation of what we've seen, uh, discussed, talked with some of the other other folks who have been involved and then put together a short report which you have sitting in front of you. Um, Matt's going to give you sort of a, a brief synopsis of what we found as part of that report and then we can have a little discussion after that. So, good. And Matt? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, as Roger said, I'm Matt Stewart, the Chief of Geotechnical Engineering for the Army Corps. Um, so I'll start with the engineering evaluation, we call it. It's not, not really an analysis because we approach it different than we would with Design. It's more of a forensic look at what happened at this particular location. So some of the factors we would use to design a structure like this, we don't know. So we're trying to back calculate some of these factors to really see what the performance was of the system. So what that really means in a nutshell is we looked at multiple cases, different loadings, different factors that would go into that design if we were going to do it from scratch to see uh, what we think happened. And we looked at two cases. We looked at a fully loaded HESCO barrier, which is what you had here, um, plus 2.2 feet, which is what we think the elevation of the water was ultimately on the 30th of April when the wall uh, failed. Um, what I will say in a nutshell is none of the cases we explored would have resulted in failure. I mean, the system should have performed as designed uh, after it was uh, installed. So. Uh, without going into all the details on the analysis piece, um, that is kind of the bottom line of the problem. So after we looked at multiple ten or eight loading cases, as you see in the memo, and for sliding failure stability, um, and four loading cases for overturning, um, they all came back with ex acceptable. So something else essentially was the cause. There's extenuating circumstances um, that we lay out in the recommendations piece that I, I'll go through in detail with you now. Um, so most likely, I'll, first of all, I'll describe what we think actually happened. So what happened was the, the, the HESCO barrier was loaded to the top. Essentially, it was loaded beyond the top onto the sandbags that we saw uh, the day of the inspection. Um, it caused, uh, for some reason, outside of that, if, if everything would have been, everything was as designed, we don't think this possibly would have happened other than things like rainfall, wet pavement, loss of sand in the HESCOs, uh, things of that nature that reduce essentially the, the resisting force <coughs> for the wall against the water. Um, so, so of all the cases we looked at, um, like I said, they, they all passed. So what we think happened was due to some of those extenuating circumstances, uh, the HESCO basket started to slide. And once it slid, it caught and it rolled. And that's, that's mostly based on, like I said, things that we can't completely quantify because we weren't here um, during the failure. So. Some of the recommendations that came out of the report, um, there's a couple categories of recommendations for one for future temporary flood wall uh, 
installation, and then the other for uh, monitoring. So obviously, uh, we would add height in the form of another HESCO barrier uh, would be our first recommendation. Once the water gets to about two thirds the height of the HESCO, that would be our, our recommendation for a trigger point to install a second line of HESCO, which, which I think would happen. Um, lateral support, if we are going to stick with one line of HESCO for whatever reason, we suggest adding lateral support behind the HESCO wall um, as, a, as a secondary means of resisting um, that loading. Um, another observation was the, the sheeting that's required on HESCO that goes under the, the HESCO and then wraps around. Um, we would recommend that we don't wrap that all the way around to the dry side side of the HESCO, uh, but keep that open so we can do a better inspection and observation of the system during performance. These are temporary systems, as you know, and they have to be monitored as such. Um, if it's completely encapsulated in the plastic, it really limits the ability to do that. Uh, risk communication. Risk communication is a big part of what we do in the core now, and that's a piece we highly recommend. We recommend that on all, all of our projects that have any risk, especially with um, you know, population and businesses inside that protected area. Uh, you know, there's three, the risk, the risk calculation for something like this has three variables. It has the loading, which would be the flood, and, and it has the performance of the system, and that's what we're talking about with monitoring third piece is really the, the protected area consequences. And that's the piece where if we would have had more, more lead time or the ability to, to inform um, can reduce risk. So that's why we, we really push risk, risk communication and risk. Um, HESCO also provides, as they did during this, this uh, inspection and assessment, uh, they do provide technical assistance and highly recommend that that happens to be through the core, the core is available to, of course, and HESCO during and throughout the flood, event, during the installation and throughout the flood, uh, to make sure that system performs. <coughs> uh, then monitoring, um, of course, that's obvious, but it is mentioned in the memo um, that to have the, the materials on site to, to triage the system as needed to make sure we're monitoring on a consistent basis periodically. last one is uh, training. Training is an important thing, really to stay vigilant during the flood fight and uh, really keep the staff up to speed, working with HESCO and CORE to uh, be able to implement that in the best way possible. So that's really the findings and the recommendations we were going to present today. Uh, does anybody You have mentioned questions? something about friction and sliding. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. With, okay. with that, and, and my understanding is what you said is the it was set up properly. We just had the all the issues that came on created the sliding. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So, so the way we do that, um, no more to draw, but <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, you can envision a cross section of a HESCO, so a box, and we've got the load on one side, which is the water, and we've got no load on the other side. So the weight, the weight in the HESCO, combined with that friction coefficient you're talking about. Is the resisting force against the hydrostatic load that's being pushed? Okay. As sand comes out of that, due to seepage, ongoing flood um, mitigated things like seepage can draw sand out from under the bags. There's no there's no bottom to the to the basket. Uh, there can be holes that allow sand to leave the system. That's a normal part of the, the triage process. So as that weight, as that sand disappears your coefficient, your weight times that coefficient gets less and less. So your resisting force essentially gets less while your flood load is staying the same. So that's really, you know, And that created the potential sliding. We, we believe, yeah, that that is a contributing, one of the contributing factors, yeah. Was the excessive rainfall a factor? I know you talked about because we've had a lot of rainfall at that same time as well. Is it, do you feel, I think that was something you mentioned. That's right. right. Well, part of, part of having the heavy rainfall at the time, you really couldn't tell how much water was coming through. <coughs> Typically, if it, was, if, it was, if it was a drier situation, you could tell if 
some amount of water that's coming through the HESCOs or underneath the HESCOs. When you're getting heavy rainfall, you really can't tell the difference. And so it's possible that there was water coming underneath or coming through, but you weren't able to see it because of the heavy rainfall at that time. So again, we don't know exactly because we weren't there to see it, or probably nobody could see it because of the heavy rainfall, but that could have been an extenuating factor. Good. Yeah, I, I had a question about the rain. Yeah, I was just looking, and it looks like we had about three and a half inches of rain over the 48 hours before this happened. So, and that's a, you know, an angle street, and well, all of them do, but it's very angled, and so water was pouring everywhere in the city. Um, could that have added to the, you know, obviously you couldn't see if water was coming out, but could that have added to the um, slippage underneath the, the plastic that was there? I mean, it was torrential. Um, the rain itself was a it, contributing factor. Is that the question? Yeah. Um, could it have undercut from the back the plastic or? Uh, I, I would it? An anticipate the rain having an effect underneath the Esco wall because mm -hmm. there isn't a direct connection. That rain hits the sand and it'll. it'll uh, I was talking about it coming down. The, it was down the pouring down the streets. Yeah. On the dry side. Yeah. On the dry side. Pouring down the street on the dry side. No, actually, when you when you think about that cross section I described, mm -hmm. if, if we have water now, those dynamic forces of that water hitting the Hesco, mm -hmm. like the moving water, um, I, I really don't think there's enough velocity there to have an effect. Uh, but water, any ponded water on the inside, actually reduces the net pressure across the system, which is a good thing. So, so I, I guess I wouldn't expect that to be extended. Mike, did you have? Yeah. So okay, thank you. So do I understand you say, so you say the system should have worked with one row of Hesco? That's what you said, to clarify? If, if you look at the engineering evaluation, um, if we loaded two tenths of a foot above the top of the Hesco with the sandbags, the calculations um, would demonstrate that. Yeah. Even with the river that high? Yes. Okay, so the, and, and I don't know who wrote this because we just got handed this, so it's hard to as a question sure, when you get right. two minutes before. Right? Um, how can you say the railroad did not have, cause any part of this? What made you determine? I mean, I don't, again, well, I don't know who wrote this. So. Yeah, yeah, well, we, we all had a hand in it. Um, the, the reason we, we don't point a finger at the railroad is because the, the reason that we think it could have an effect is the wave action on the Hesco system. The waves on the HESCO, the, the gates were closed for more than 24 hours before the HESCO failed. Um, now with that said, you can have waves from wind, because we have a long fetch there. So, so all types of waves are affecting that system. And to be fair to that statement, we didn't do a detailed analysis of the wave action on okay. the system. Okay, a couple more. Yep. Um, so you, you got there two weeks after the breach. That was your initial look. So the breach happened on the 30th, and you were there 13 May. All right, so the one point here says a second row of flood barrier vessels should be added during initial reaction. So if, if you say the first one level is good, why do we need to add the second row? Just to make sure? If the, you need the second, if you're going to get at least two thirds of the way up onto that, yeah. onto the basket, <coughs> at that point you, you want a second layer behind it. So what our recommendation would be is you would put in two sets of baskets. You wouldn't have to fill the one closer to the dry side initially oh, okay. until just to, to be ready. Yep. Right. right. So then if the projection comes, you're going to get up at least two thirds of the way on that basket, then you can fill the next set if you want to. Of course, you could fill both sets yep. to start with if you want to. No, I get it. Okay, to be ready, that makes sense too. Okay, and then one last, um, provide additional ladder support. So that's what you're saying basically. Um, when installing a single line, always have a second there ready to go. Well, either either that way or, or like if one of the pictures in there shows there were some concrete blocks that were where the pumps were, where the mm -hmm. pumps went over, yep. um, as well as where the the railroad's portion tied in. There were a bunch of sandbags that helped. So you need, we would recommend you put something behind there at different points to provide that extra lateral support other than just the HESCOs by themselves if they're going to be filled, you know, at least halfway up. Yes. Some other lateral support. Thanks. Edith? Oh, yeah. Um, 
just a few things. Uh, one, so has there been any research on gross, so you mentioned friction, and that makes sense. Um, so has there been research about road surfaces that are better than others for this sure. type of, so like road surface along River Drive, is what we have adequate, or is there a better road surface that's been proven to increase the friction on the bottom of sure, sure. the so barriers? The coefficient of friction is a lab measured mm -hmm. Uh, and we've tested, I mean, science, the, the industry has tested many, many combinations of, you know, sand with soil, sand with concrete. Um, it's used in mechanical type engineering, too, for engine friction. I mean, this, this is the concrete. Um, asphalt concrete or asphalt out there like you have is, is probably one of the least ideal to, to, for, for that coefficient. Um, soil on soil is very good, rock, uh, the bigger the particle typically on the surface, so if we did a coarser sand versus a fine sand, the larger particle sand versus smaller particle sand, the coarser sand will win out. So in putting sand in the barriers, I'm envisioning for what we have out there that's currently not ideal, <coughs> the surface of the road, putting sandbags in the barrier first and then adding sand, would that have helped? Would that help a little bit? No, I, I, I don't wouldn't deviate. Don't I wouldn't those. deviate from Hesco's okay. recommendations, okay. and and your your crew is very good at, at installing those. So, so they, what's they an ideal what's an ideal road surface for the Hesco barrier in this type of situation? Um, well, soil on soil would be better. Um, well, River Drive is not going to be right. turned into a dirt road, but, so. But you can alleviate that with the second row of Hesco. But that would decrease our maintenance if we had dirt road. Down. Well, it's also older than us. As you recall, we talked about if we potentially remove the mediums at River Drive, right. that might present an opportunity to right. put some sort of like rougher concrete or something. That That's where I was thinking of, yeah. increasing the friction underneath yeah. the barriers. A um, couple of things. So there was a, a failure in uh, Burlington. And they had two lines of HESCO barriers, like you're suggesting in the document, one up on the riverside and one behind support, plus another line above. Are you familiar with that? Did you look at that at all? We're familiar with that. Any, we, any, we didn't do any forensic type okay. evaluation. Do you know why that theirs failed? Because they had that sort of pyramid shape. We, we don't know why. Okay. So in your, in your document, I just, uh, can you explain the L shape? So it sounds like in here you recommend two different plans. One is, Having a row of barriers on the riverside plus an empty row as a just in case, which makes sense. Right. But then it's, it also read somewhere else of having two on two, two stacked high, like in a perfect cube. Or are you talking about doing a, a pyramid like they did in Burlington? It's so like that an if L you do a cross section, section then like it's we two did, L's. I can pull up the second. So when we when we built for the third crest, right? That's what I mean. So when you do a cross section, you yep, get so two it's L's. An L. That's the two L's on each side that you're talking about. It's just one, one L. L. One L. Like the L facing the river. Mm -hmm. And then, um, if you do the pyramid, you have to put sandbags on either side. Okay. So the when um, so the second row of Hesco's yeah. is on the is on the back side is what you're saying to create the L facing the water. Yeah. Got it. That's how and we set it up for the third crest. But that so that Here. so the, the, the sheer pressure of the water, so the sheer pressure of the water coming in from that side, and you have an L shape. If the water crests above that initial Hesco barrier, how does that second level make it? better? Or is that second second level of HESCO just there to add weight to that first level to keep it in place well, it so that the friction piece it, doesn't happen? Understanding, um, if it goes above the first line of HESCO, that becomes your line of protection, the second line of HESCO. So you need that there so it doesn't overtop the system. That's not a point of weakness, though, having the second line by itself in the back? That uh, holds, typically? It'll be yeah. pinned together. Yeah. It'll it, it performs just like a single wood to the two thirds trigger elevation. Even at the second level. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Actually, it would perform probably better because you have sand on sand. So you're go, going back to what you said before. Okay. The coefficient of friction will be higher. So the second level, the second level would hold better than the first level. The friction alone. between those two alone. would be better than the friction between the, a yeah, single yeah. bottom and the street. Carrie, did you have something first? I did. No, come on. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. So my question, and just briefly looking through this, um, I wasn't, I didn't see, and I could have missed. Um, I'm just curious as to the time. So obviously, this the extended period of time that we had the water that high was was different for us, um, not usual. 
hopefully this is happening again. Um, so I'm just curious if that was anything, I and mean, is it meant to hold for an extended period of time? Is there really a limit on it? Uh, the, the limit would probably be, would be a better question for HESCO. Okay. Um, but like I said in the beginning, you know, the triaging of the system is really important. Um, the lot, it's normal for it to lose sand, but it's a temporary system, so you wouldn't expect it to perform forever um, without a lot of care. Uh, so yes, the, the floodwaters being extended certainly took a toll on the system, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't be effective with the proper maintenance and care. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Let me hear it. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned something just briefly that you thought that the installation was sufficient, um, which obviously in retrospect is kind of hard to tell. Um, I've kind of been looking at, at these words over again that it's insufficient resisting forces. Um, and it kind of sounds like from, from the conversation that we've been having is that it's likely that the duration maybe uh, created that, you know, the, it sabotaged some of the sand out or something and that um, by not being able to monitor that properly, that's probably kind of where things started to go wrong. I don't know if that's where they started to go wrong, but okay. that certainly is a concern okay. for the performance of the system. Yes. Okay. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Well, since it seems that another level of barrier to help reinforce hold seems to be the thought process, mm -hmm. would, and did you look at it, would you? think possibly that if you put the HESCOs on the river side of those cement barriers, would that work? That would be, we, we talked about it to some degree, and that would be an option. The problem you have there <coughs> is trying to build a fill, yep. because now you, somehow you're going to have to get yourself up and over those barriers to then be able to fill them, and you also lose your ability then if you need to for monitoring, now they're sitting up against there, so you're not going to be able to see anything coming through them. And if you need to add another row, you're, you've restricted yourself pretty heavily. Fair enough. I, I don't want to, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but really it sounds as if the, it started to slip. And the idea is if we were able to prevent it from slipping, um, that may have had a much different result. And therefore, the second row. Uh, tied it right from the beginning because it's you can't do it in the middle of the flood Add the second rows. That's your recommendation. I think is get it set up So we could fill it if we need it be ready to go and then give that extra pressure to keep it from sliding That seems to be the, the best it was just installed properly, but over a long period of time It started to slide is that a summary of what you said? I mean simply enough for me to say that. Yeah <laughs> I said a lot of things. <laughs> yes, that was good. Ready. Great presentation. I think the city crews have done an incredible job in flood management. And the Hesco barriers have done a great job there. Unique situation, great recommendations. You know, next time, whatever happens, you know, public works will be prepared for reinforcement, but um, just an incredibly unique situation that happened this year. And, you know, even if we would have done l shape, there's always a possibility 50, 60 days of rain and holding back 15 foot of the Mississippi, even that could fail. So great job for the crew, Team Davenport, and uh, we'll be prepared better next time. And you know, thanks for the presentation. Read it. I just had just two follow up. Um, so they're putting bridges on the road to increase the friction underneath the HESCO barriers. I assume there's a optimal type of ridge or indentation to put in that does that. Did you talk about bridges? Well, like the ruggedized concrete. Yeah. Oh. So, so if the road needs to be, if we would have had more success of this notch sliding, okay. increased friction of the road, if we remove the medians, we could rough up the road. So I think of the ridges on the side of the highway when you kind of slip over and, the, and it wakes you up. So is there an optimal ridge that if you use calculations, that there's an optimal shape of that ridge that um, works the best? I guess there probably is. I don't, wouldn't know off the top of my head. Um, but I guess the, my focus would be on the weight of the sand in the basket. Because we know the basket should perform if it's 
built properly and it's aligned properly. The second row, just to sum up, the second row is really there to, to deploy quickly in the event you have to go above the four feet. Okay, so, so the basket behind the basket really isn't to prevent the sliding. We think that single row will perform as long as the water's below two thirds of the feet. So three feet. about three feet. Um, if, and there's trigger points, right, in an in a emergency plan where you'd say, okay, we know our hydrograph is going to go, we know the river's going to come up above within that one foot of the top of the first, so we want to deploy the second row and get the L shape put together. But didn't you so, say earlier that it, some of it was due to the basket sliding? Yes, the failure mode is the sliding of the basket, mm -hmm. but I would say the more important thing, other than the coefficient of friction, which is important, is the, the ability to get the weight there, the, the weight of the sand. So you had said something about the railroad. So I know the railroad lifting the rails and that vibration was not happening at the same time as, of course, this flood piece. But the baskets are put into place, and they're all linked together, and they're settled in their position, and you have strong vibrations come through. Could, would that have dislodged the baskets just, just enough that that sheer pressure coming from the river, even if it's two or three weeks separated, would have been enough to, to maybe alter what I'm thinking of the friction between the baskets and the actual ground. Because the rope, because I was down there, so my office is down there, and I watched the, the railroad lift the tracks and lay the gravel, and it was, it's an impressive process that they have, but it also creates a quite a bit of vibration on the ground itself that reverberate, reverberates out. Um, so you didn't find any connection at all, even with a, a time distance, like two or three week gap between the raising of the rails and the movement of the baskets. To be fair, we didn't delve too deeply into the vibration piece. We thought about the wave action piece of the train going through the water. Um, I ask, it just makes me yeah. think of like earthquakes. You, you have an earthquake, but then the vibrations <laughs> that ripple out actually can impact you know, miles away. But one of, one of the advantages of sand is when it does vibrate, it settles it pretty settles. quickly. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, if, if that was a brick structure or some other you know, structural, possibly, but in this case, I would have much more expected it would have happened as a train was going by as opposed to 24 hours later. And, you know, to your point of the sand settling, I actually spent some time researching HESCO barriers mm -hmm. and fascinating product. Um, some of the HESCO barriers used in our military applications overseas are still standing 20 years later. Mm -hmm. So with no That's maintenance. That's what they were initially designed with, for. With no maintenance. So there's right. some, there can be some permanence to them depending on what their use is. But to your point that the sand settles, it really does settle because that's evidence in other areas of the world. All right. Uh, thank you guys for all the time in the field with us. It was pretty muddy that day if I remember right. <laughs> um, and then Nicole, so we got the reports and had the time to look at. So if we had a flood come tomorrow, what modifications would we make? Um, in our current flood plan. Uh, and Nicole brought us by uh, the four as well, but we wanted to share that with council. So what, what have we learned from this that we would do differently tomorrow? And, and some of us will be rehashing because you all asked such wonderful questions. <laughs> and in addition, for the media present, um, this is on our website. Now the, the full report and, and slides available for, for viewing there. And of course, the flood task force is, of course, getting this. As well. They'll be presented next week. Okay. Yep. So, go ahead. This one. So, um, again, just to reiterate with the plastic sheeting, just we confirmed this with the manufacturer as well. They said ideally it's six inches, no more than 12 inches under the front there on the, on the water side. Um, and then we did discuss the second layer and optimally the two lower layers being set up initially so they can be pinned together properly per spec um, at the installation. You can't pin them together post installation because the full sand doesn't allow for the pinning. Um, so if we do have a forecast above 20, um, we would then start working on that second layer up so that we would be ahead of um, any sort of flash flooding event as we saw at the end of April. Again, though, um, this is going to be condition specific, as, as they mentioned, this wave action. We do get, when the river's that high, especially with wind, you do start getting wake. So I would say anything above 24 is going to be condition specific, dependent because there could be wakes that then would start lapping over the top. So, Nicole, so then is your intent or thinking intent? Anytime we build, we're going to have one, we're going to have one 
the setup ready to go. It would be pinned together, not necessarily filled. Got that. Correct. Yeah. Anytime we build, we yeah. build. Yeah. And that's specific to this area here, not all the areas that we deploy. The Eskimos would be that correct. And then um, just the emergency communications piece, when um, we, we did this year in March, do meetings um, that were open to the public with um, the businesses and residents. But if we do have to deploy the flood wall to do more direct communication with those that are in the impact area, um, additional more structured training, we do training obviously, but um, add some more structure to that. Um, and then the, as they recommended and we did with that third press this year, we did have the manufacturer come in um, along with the floor and review the setup of that L shape. And then again, uh, we did hear back that we don't believe there's any uh, grant funding to tied to the Canadian planters, so that is something we will be doing more diligence on and, and likely bringing back to council as far as on some of those median removals. Thank you again so much. Um, we really appreciate you guys spending the time, in, and I know this was not a short task for you, so appreciate you guys spending the time with us. And thank you for giving a little review of what we just talked about. It really was reiteration of, I think, what I've heard is the staff heard what you said and took those recommendations into consideration. And, and I think everybody feels better that we had somebody of your quality and experience give an overview because that's important. Uh, even though we felt as if everything had been installed properly, but it's good to have somebody say, yep, and there's issues and all the things, the other conditions came into it. So thank you for that. Any other questions anybody has? Yeah, well, again, Matt and Roger, thank you very much. And you can hang out with us if you want, but you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I'll mention to Colonel Sattinger as well how well you did as well. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So calendar items of note, 